When we ended last time, we were talking about whether Casey Martin has a right to ride in a golf cart in the PGA tournament. And it's worth remembering how we got into this debate and what's at stake for an understanding of political philosophy. Remember, we were looking at Aristotle's theory of justice, and one way of describing his approach to justice, we've called it teleological, teleological because he says to allocate rights, we first have to figure out the purpose or the end of the social practice in question. Another way of describing Aristotle's account of justice is that justice is for him a matter of fit. It's a matter of fitting persons with their virtues and excellences to the appropriate roles. Now, I want to finish our discussion about Casey Martin and his claim for a golf cart and then go back to one more consequential application in Aristotle, namely the question of slavery. What do you think about Casey Martin's request? Should there be an accommodation or not, given the nature of the game and of the tournament and its purposes? Isn't it discrimination if he's not provided the golf cart as an accommodation, say some? Others reply, no, if he got a cart, it would be unfair to the other golfers because they exert themselves, become winded, fatigued, walking the course. That's where we left it. What about the fairness argument? Okay, Jenny. My question was, why doesn't the PGA just make the option of a cart available to all golfers? Um, from our readings, I learned that there are many golf tournaments other than the PGA where using a cart is not prohibited. And for something like the seniors tournament, it's even allowed and encouraged. So why doesn't the PGA just do that? Let everybody use a cart. Or give everyone the option of using a cart and let them pick. So the traditionalist can say, well, I still choose to walk the course, but I do that knowing that I will be more tired at the end than the people who took the cart. Good. All right, so what about Jenny's solution? For the sake of fairness, don't give Casey Martin an advantage, if indeed there is an advantage to riding in a cart. Let everyone who wants to use a cart. Is everyone happy with that solution? Does it put to rest this whole dilemma? Who has an answer for Jenny? Yes. As was brought up last time, if you do that, you, you kind of ruin some of the spirit of golf, as a lot of people like to see it, if you let everybody take a cart. Um, even though it gives everybody the same playing field now, it sort of makes golf less of an athletic game, like you pointed out last class. It's just like um, if someone decides to go into another sport and they want an advantage, like if you have swimming, and then you say, okay, he wants flippers, so why don't we just allow everyone to have flippers during swimming? And what would that do to the Olympic swimming competition if people were free to use Jenny? And here, we better let Jenny reply to this. Da says, it would sort of spoil the spirit of the athletic competition as if in Olympic swimming you let anyone who wanted to swim with flippers. All right, Jenny, what do you say to Da? It would spoil the spirit of it. You are also ruining the spirit of golf by not letting people who are really passionate about the game and very good at it compete simply because of an aspect of golf which is not, the main point of golf is you use this club to make strokes and hit it into a hole. I'm sorry, I'm not a golfer, but that's basically my, the gist of the game from what I see it. And I was reading the PJ versus Casey Martin decision. That was one of the um, sentences that they said is, because walking the course is not an inherent part of golf, only swinging the club is. Good, so Jenny replies to Da, well, it isn't really essential anyhow to walk the course. So we're back to the purpose. I mean, I'm sure there are, like wheelchair basketball, there are certain um, different 
competitions that can be made for people who may only be able to use their arms. Right. Yes. Michael, what do you think? And you just said that there's stuff like wheelchair, wheelchair basketball, where if you can't play basketball, there's another option. I think there's other options than the PGA Tour, but the PGA Tour is like, the, it's, it's the best, it's the pinnacle, and you have to have certain requirements fulfilled to, to perform. All right, Michael, you want to say to Casey Martin, you go, there is a, such a thing as the Special Olympics for those who are disabled. Go play in the golf, golfing version of the Special Olympics. That's what you would say, Michael. Yeah. I think that walking is part of the sport of golf, and Casey Martin, you know, you can't, if you can't walk the course, then I don't think you should be able to play on the PGA. All right, good. Thank you very much for that exchange. What comes out of this exchange that goes back to Aristotle's theory of justice? Well, one thing is the question, is walking an essential part of golf? And the very fact that deciding whether there is a right for Casey Martin that the PGA must respect seems to depend, as Aristotle suggests it must, on debating and resolving the question, is walking essential to the game of golf? That's one moral of the story. But there's a second moral to the story from an Aristotelian point of view. What's at stake here this is the second Aristotelian stake in this debate, is honor. Casey Martin wants the accommodation so that he can compete for the honor of winning the best tournaments. Now, why is it that the professional golfers, the great golfers, testified in this case, Jack Nicklaus, Tom Kite, in the readings, against letting them use a cart, and they, I suspect, would be equally vehement, Jenny, in opposing your suggestion of letting everyone ride a cart, and this goes back, in a way, to Da's point. How to put this gently? Professional golfers are sensitive about whether their sport is really a sport. <laughs> because if everyone rode around in a cart, or could, then it would become clear, or clearer, depending on your point of view, that golf is not really an athletic competition, but rather a game, a game of skill, but not a sport. And so, not only the question of debating the purpose, the teleological feature, but also from the standpoint of viewing debates about the purpose of golf, what's essential to golf, those debates, Aristotle suggests, inevitably are also debates about the allocation of honor. Because part of the purpose of golf is not just to amuse spectators, Scalia is wrong about that, from Aristotle's point of view. It's not just to provide entertainment. It's not just to make people happy. It's not a mere amusement. It's honoring, it's rewarding, it's recognizing a certain kind of athletic excellence. At least those who have achieved the highest honors have a powerful stake in maintaining that view. Now, some of you took the position, the Scalia position. This is an incredibly difficult and silly question, Scalia said. What is the essential nature of golf? It's not the kind of thing that the United States Supreme Court is equipped to decide or should decide. That's Scalia. But he only says that because he takes a very strong, and as it happens, anti-Aristotelian position on what a game is. It is the very nature of a game to have no object, no point, except amusement, says Scalia. That is what distinguishes games, he says, from productive activity. <laughs> you can just imagine what kind of sports fan Scalia must be. And so he says it's impossible to say that any of a game's arbitrary rules is essential. 
And then he quotes Mark Twain's disparaging remark about golf. He says, many consider walking to be the central feature of golf. Hence, Mark Twain's classic criticism of the sport, a good walk spoiled. <laughs> but Scalia misses an important feature of games and the arguments about rights and fairness that arise from games when he casts games, sports, athletic competitions as solely for the sake of amusement, as solely a utilitarian activity. But an Aristotelian view of sports says, no, it's not just about amusement. Real sports, real athletic events, are also about appreciation, not just amusement. And people who follow sports and care about sports and play sports know this, which is another way of saying there's a difference between a sport and a mere spectacle. And the difference is that a sport is a practice that calls forth and honors and prizes certain excellences, certain virtues, and the people who appreciate those virtues are the true fans, the informed fans, and for them watching the sport is not mere amusement, but that means that it's always possible to make sense of a debate about what feature of a sport is essential to it. We can make sense of these arguments, never mind the question whether the court should decide. The PGA in its own internal deliberations can make sense of that debate, which is why they cared very much about their view, insisting on their view, that walking and exertion and fatigue are essential, not peripheral parts of sport. Well, this is all to illustrate the teleological and the honorific feature of debates about rights, which Aristotle says we need to take account of in thinking about justice. Now, I want to begin for us to consider whether Aristotle's theory of justice is right or wrong, whether it's persuasive or unpersuasive. And I want to get your thoughts about that. But I want to anticipate one obvious and important objection. If justice is about fit, fitting persons to roles, matching virtues to the appropriate honors and recognition, if that's what justice is, does it leave room for freedom? And this is one of the main objections to Aristotle's teleological account of justice. If certain roles, social roles, are fitting or appropriate to me, where does that leave my right to choose my social roles, my life purposes, for myself? What room does teleology leave for freedom? And in fact, you may remember, Rawls rejects teleological accounts of justice because he says that teleological theories of justice threaten the equal basic rights of citizens. So let's, let's begin to examine whether Aristotle is right, and in particular, whether his teleological way of thinking about justice is at odds with freedom. Now, one obvious reason to worry is Aristotle's defense of slavery. He defends slavery, which existed as an institution in the Athens of his day. Well, what is his defense of slavery? Two things, two conditions have to be met for slavery to be just. 
First, it has to be necessary. And Aristotle says, at least in our society, slavery is necessary. Why is it necessary? If there are to be citizens who are freed from manual and menial and household chores to go to the assembly to deliberate about politics, there have to be some who look after those menial tasks, the mere necessities of life. He says, unless you could invent in some science fiction a technological fix, then there are going to be those who have to do the hard and difficult and menial labor if there are to be citizens deliberating about the good and realizing their nature. So slavery is necessary for the life of the polis, for there to be open to citizens. the life of deliberation, of argument, of practical wisdom. But there's a further condition that has to be met. Slavery has not only to be necessary for the community as a whole to function, but it also has to be the case, remember the criterion of fit, it also has to be the case that there are some people for whom being a slave is the just or the fitting or the appropriate condition. Now, Aristotle agrees that by his own standards, both of those conditions must be met, must be true, if slavery is to be just. And then, in a deplorable passage, he says, well, it is true that there are some people who are fit by nature, who are cut out to be slaves. These are people who differ from ordinary people in the same way that the body differs from the soul. These are people who are meant to be ruled. And for them, their nature is best realized if they're slaves. They can recognize reason in others, but they can't partake of it. They can't exercise it. And somehow we can know this. Now, Aristotle must have known that there was something dodgy, something strained about this claim because he quickly acknowledges that those who disagree may have a point. And what those who disagree point out is that there are a lot of people in Athens who are slaves, not because they were born to be slaves or fit to be slaves, but because they were captured, they were losers in a war. And so Aristotle admits that as practiced in ancient Athens, Slavery didn't necessarily line up with who actually is fit or born to be a slave because some actual slaves just were slaves by bad luck, by being captured in a war. And on Aristotle's own account, even if it's necessary to have slavery for the sake of, this, of citizenship, it's unjust if people who aren't properly slaves are cast in that role. There is a misfit. Aristotle recognizes that slavery for those who aren't fit for the task is a kind of coercion. The reason slavery is wrong is not because it's coerced. Coercion is an indicator that it's wrong because it's not natural. If you have to coerce someone into a role, that's a pretty good indication that they don't belong there, that that role isn't fitting for them. And Aristotle recognized this. So all of this is to say the example of slavery, Aristotle's defense of it, doesn't show that there's anything wrong in principle with teleological argument or with the idea of justice as fit between persons and roles, because it's perfectly possible within Aristotle's own terms to explain what's wrong with this application, this practical application that he made of his theory. I want to turn to the larger challenge to Aristotle in the name of freedom. But before I do that, I want to see what people think of Aristotle's account of justice as fit, his teleological way of reasoning about justice, and the honorific dimension of rights and of distributive justice that emerged in our discussion of flutes and politics and golf. Questions of clarification about Aristotle or objections 
to his overall account. Yes? My objection to uh, Aristotle is that he wants to match uh, a person to a role. And, you know, if, if you walk like a pirate and you talk like a pirate, you know, you should be a pirate. And, and that is what is right. Um, and so what, what's strange and seemed paradoxical to me about Aristotle's viewpoint is that if you walk like a pirate and you talk like a pirate, you shouldn't be an investment banker because that's, that's not what you're inherently supposed to do. If you have a peg leg and an eye patch and a disgruntled disposition, you know, uh, you should be on a pirate ship on the high seas. Um, so he doesn't, his... Uh, some, would say, some would say that the distinction between the two vocations is not as clear as you suggest. <laughs> All right, but that's good. I take the point. Yes. Go ahead. It just seems to ignore individual rights. So I might be the perfect janitor in the whole world, and I can do that job the most efficiently out of anybody that exists right now, but I might not want to do that. I might want to do any other number of pursuits, and it seems to say that that isn't really a good option for me. All right, and what's your name? Mary-Kate. Good. All right, let's, uh, let's take a couple more. Yes. I think that the golf cart exchange sort of brought up what I see as my main objection to this theological um, mode of reasoning. I mean, Michael, I think that was your name, right? Yeah. Believes that walking is an inherent part of golf. Myself, I believe that walking is not an inherent part of golf. And I feel that no matter how long we debate this particular point of contention, we're never going to reach an accord. The theological framework of reasoning, I believe, doesn't really allow us to come to any sort of agreement. All right, and what's your name? Patrick. Patrick, all right, let me try to address this set of objections to Aristotle. Let me start with Patrick's. It's an important objection. We had a debate about whether walking is essential to golf, and even in so seemingly trivial, or at least contained, a case is that we couldn't agree. How can we possibly hope to agree when the stakes are higher and when we're debating the fundamental purposes or ends of political community? And so if we can't agree on what the ends or the goods of our shared public life consist in, how can we base justice and rights on some notion of what the end or the purpose or the good consists in? That's an important objection, so much so that much modern political theory takes that worry about disagreement over the good as its starting point and concludes that justice and rights and constitutions should not be based on any particular conception of the good or the purposes of political life, but should instead provide a framework of rights that leaves people free to choose their conceptions of the good, their own conceptions of the purposes of life. Now, Mary Kate said, what if a person is very well suited to having a certain role, like the role of being a janitor, but wants something else? wants to reach higher, wants to choose another way of life. So that goes back to this question about freedom. If we take our bearing as persons from roles that are said to fit our nature, shouldn't it at least be up to us to decide what those roles are? In fact, shouldn't it be up to us to define what roles are suitable to us? And that's going to take us back the confrontation between Aristotle on the one hand and Kant and Rawls on the other. Kant and Rawls think Patrick has a point. They say precisely because people disagree in pluralist societies about the nature of the good life, we shouldn't try to base justice on any particular answer to that question. So they reject teleology. They reject the idea of tying justice to some conception of the good. What's at stake in the debate about teleology, say Rawlsian and Kantian liberals, 
is this. If you tie justice to a particular conception of the good, if you see justice as a matter of fit between a person and his or her roles, you don't leave room for freedom. And to be free is to be independent of any particular roles or traditions or conventions that may be handed down by my parents or my society. So in order to decide, as between these two broad traditions, whether Aristotle is right or whether Kant and Rawls are right, we need to investigate whether the right is prior to the good, question one, and we need to investigate what it means to be a free person, a free moral agent. Does freedom require that I stand toward my roles, my ends, and my purposes as an agent of choice or as someone trying to discover what my nature really is? Two big questions, and we'll take them up next time.